Isabella Jaramillo and I use she, her pronouns. We're here for another Ocean Stewards Spotlight, a segment we do here where we hope to highlight ocean stewards from diverse backgrounds, connecting more ocean lovers with stories that may be inspiring to them. And today I'm joined by Erin McCall. Hi Erin, how are you? Hi, my name is Erin McCall and I use he, they pronouns. I'm actually from Costa Mesa, California or um, the indigenous Tongva and Ahachiman land. Great. Okay, so let's just jump right into it. So my first question for you is, can you tell the audience a little bit more about yourself and how you became an accidental activist? Yeah, so honestly, I grew up with a real connection to civic duty. My mom always had us, you know, we would go in the voting booth and stand on her toes and mark um, on the, you know, ballot. But then also, I had a real passion for the ocean because I grew up um, in Pasadena, California. And, you know, we had like to drive like an hour or so to get to the, to the beach. And so I had, I would get Surfer Magazine every month from the grocery store and then tear out articles and pictures of folks surfing and like hang them on my wall because I just loved the ocean and surf culture so much. And that's how I kind of got my start and interest in like ocean conservation because I read an article about, you know, the dying coral reef, which inspired me to try to get my school to have a recycling program because I just was scared about the plastic getting in the ocean, right? Um, but I had a science focus and science background. I was going to become a psychology professor. That was the goal. And so I really felt like politics were for other people. You know, I'm saying I thought that, you know, hey, we vote every once in a while, but like, you know, this is not a thing for everyday people. They're like political people who do this kind of thing. Um, but what happened was, is of course, you know, in 2016, Donald Trump became elected president. And, you know, I saw in that moment, that not only was he a threat to our civil rights and social justice, but also to our oceans, right? Because he was saying that he was going to increase offshore drilling off the coast of California, that he didn't believe climate change was a priority, um, you know, and that he was going to um, cut protections that made it so that we had less pollution and less um, plastic, you know, in, in our communities. And so that was how I kind of stumbled into this position where I got involved with the Indivisible movement at the time. Um, and I just was like, okay, this is a once a week thing that I'm gonna do uh, until eventually it wasn't a once a week thing. It became a, a, a full-time job and a full-time commitment where we worked uh, very hard to get rid of our then Congress member, Dana Rohrabacher. So Dana Rohrabacher was the Congress member of the 40th district. He had been in Congress for nearly 30 years and was one of the most anti-climate, anti-ocean elected officials in Congress. What's super wild, of course, is that he represented the coastal region of California, Huntington Beach, Newport Beach, and Laguna Beach. Um, and his stances really were against, you know, business owners, residents, and just community members of these coastal communities, because whether or not you're Democrat, Republican, or no party preference, when you live in a coastal community, you want to be an ocean steward and make sure that you're protecting, you know, the ocean, because that's where we work, that's where we play, that's where we become one with nature, you know what I'm saying? And so it's super important to us regardless of our political background. But for Dana Rohrabacher, you know, it was important that he got corporate donations from oil companies. And so he was very pro offshore oil, very anti-science, um, very, you know, pro plastic pollution. And so I was very lucky at the time to be able to work with partners like Oceana and Surfrider to, and, you know, the California environmental voters at that time, they were called League of Conservation, but California League of Conservation Voters. But um, I was able to work with these organizations and build coalition to really build awareness in the district that their representative was not representing them. But it, I call myself an accidental activist because it went from zero to 60, right? You know, I was this kind of young, um, freshly graduated college student that was like, oh, well, you know, politics is for other people, you know, I vote, I guess, you know, that kind of thing, to leading marches in front of a congressional member's office with a bullhorn calling for the end to offshore drilling, right? Um, and so it was this wild whirlwind 
of change, but like in a good way. We ended up defeating Dana Rohrabacher and then, um, you know, we installed Harley Ruda, who was an ocean champion um, and just like was very passionate about fighting against offshore drilling and, um, you know, making sure we have clean water and clean oceans. It was just like, it was a fantastic story that, you know, changed my life for the better that made me in and out this like full-time activist person who now works for the California environmental voters on their federal programs. Awesome, that's such a great story. So my next question for you is, what is your vision for the ocean conservation community and for the conservation movement at large? Yeah, I think that what's so important to me for the ocean conservation community is that we acknowledge how climate change not only is going to affect our coastal communities, but it also affects our marginalized communities first. It affects our marginalized communities across the globe and the global south. And then that's going to cause several knock-on effects. Of course, you know, it's always really important when we talk about the ocean, we talk about the beauty of the ocean, the beauty of our coastlines and the, you know, animals that don't have a say in like what we're doing. But also we have to make sure that we're remembering the people in this, in this thing, because, you know, whether or not you have a red congressional district or a red state or whatever, there are everyday people who also are helpless in this and they don't have a say because, you know, unfortunately corporate interests are overpowering the will of the people. So I hope that like the ocean conservation movement um, moves forward and continues to be very people focused um, and also very justice focused, right? So we are currently on stolen land. And so we need to make sure that in our conservation efforts and in our protection efforts that we are centering and including marginalized communities, especially indigenous populations, um, and you know other people of color from, we include these people who've been excluded from this narrative, excluded from this work, right? You know, um, the history of conservation has unfortunately been very white, very supremacist, right? You know, the original national parks were to take away the land from the savages, right? You know, that was direct quotes from um, folks in the administration at that time. Um, and so we stole land, right, you know, at, in a way of, to like justify protecting it. And so as we work to protect our oceans, we have to make sure that we are um, including those folks in this conversation and also maintaining access for all. I think it's very important, you know, the ocean is so beautiful. It is, you know, it's where I go to like recenter myself and I love to, you know, spend time either bodyboarding, boogie boarding, sometimes occasionally surfing, um, you know, not very well, but I try my best. Um, but like doing that is so amazing, but like we have to make sure that there's access and opportunity for everyone to go, right? You know, and so limiting things like, you know, closed beaches or whatever, but making it so that folks are able to responsibly go and enjoy the ocean. Awesome. So can you tell me some of the challenges that you've faced organizing in predominantly conservative areas like Orange County? And what have you learned through working through these obstacles? Yeah, I think one of the obstacles that I found was, I think there are two obstacles. The first one is that people are definitely in their silos of what they expect and what they think um, is going to happen before it happens, right? You know, I mean, so the people are like, I'm on this side, I'm on that team. Um, and so this team's gonna win or that team's gonna lose, or, you know, I don't wanna hear anything that that person has to say. Um, so I think that when, you know, you come at it from a very political red versus blue lens, you hit a lot of walls. And so like, I think that that was one of the things that on the flip side, I learned that when you take a lens of issue advocacy, where you're talking about what the problems are and you're calling for accountability and solutions, you're able to overcome those obstacles and get folks on your side that you probably never would have imagined because we all have the shared community value of the ocean. We all wanna be ocean stewards um, regardless of our class, regardless of our socioeconomic background, regardless of our experiences, right? You know folks who live 
you know, either on the coast or folks who don't live on the coast. Like I lived in Pasadena, right? You know, but like folks who love the ocean, love the ocean. And so we can actually really all bang together around that. Um, another barrier that I've found in conservative Orange County is a lack of vision. And what I mean by that is that I think so many of us have been disappointed by the way how our leaders refuse to act and have been let down by the continued trajectory of the increased te temperatures and increased pollution that we want to give up hope, right? And we call challenges lost before we even start, right? And we begin conversations about negotiating with ourselves instead of talking about what the solution is. And so, you know, for example, if you say like, hey, we need to ban offshore drilling, folks will have already before you have the conversation about it, like, oh, well, that's like going to be so difficult. It's not going to pass or this is going to be a problem or we need to find a compromise and maybe we'll have offshore drilling for another 30 years, right? You know what I mean? Like there's like all this like, conversation. Uh, and this comes from conservatives, from progressives, from, you know, people across the political spectrum. It's the lack of vision of what the world could be. It's a lack of vision of what we need to do um, first. And so that's, I think, and, you know, when we flip the district, folks had this idea that it was impossible to win Orange County. It was Reagan town, you know, uh, uh, Dana Rohrabacher had been the Congress member for 30 years. There's no way that you're going to beat him. And so they already walked in with this sense of doubt and not with a sense of what was needed, right? And so I think in my organizing, I try to always start with, what do we need, right? You know, what is the, the base level of what we need in order to have a brighter future, a better tomorrow, a safer ocean, you know what I mean? Um, and I start from that place and then I work backwards from to like where we are now and it's hard uh I will be the first person to say that there were lots of people who had doubts about what was possible but what we've seen time and time again whether it's congressional folks people in the state legislature or now um even on city councils like in Huntington Beach you can elect ocean champions with a passion for conservation and protection. Um, you just have to set that standard, right? Of that, you know, we cannot compromise on protecting our home. We cannot compromise on clean water. We cannot compromise on um, equitable access. And when you set that standard of like, this is what we need, we're gonna work backwards from here. It's hard, it's not easy. It takes a lot of hard conversations. But um, when we do it together, we actually can go really far and accomplish, you know, some of the things beyond our wildest dreams. That was awesome. So my next question is, what do you say to people who love the ocean but don't really know how to get involved to protect it? Yeah, a hundred percent. Honestly, I think that that's like a real problem for a lot of folks, right? We see all of the things that are happening on social media. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is awful. Or we see it on the news. This is awful. What do I do? Well, you know, I'm here to tell you, there's two things that you can and should do. Number one is join Oceana. Join, you know, California environmental voters. These folks make it so easy for you to get involved as a community member to take small but significant steps to, you know, fight the climate crisis and to protect the oceans. So these, you know, there are organizations like Surfrider, um, you know, Oceana, the Sunrise Movement that you can join in your communities to do really, you know, do some good. And there are folks who will help you, guide you. And, you know, you can go through that. And that's a really big step. Another step is really actually talk to your friends. And this is so important because there are people around you in your community who feel the same way. And, you know, we just don't talk about it very often, right? Because we're afraid of, you know, angering people or politicizing things. I'm just going to tell you right now, the ocean isn't political. The ocean is for everyone, right? You know, it's where our food comes from. It's where our joy comes from. It's, you know, um, where we center ourselves. And so that's not political. And we should definitely talk to all of our friends about it. 
and they want to get involved too and then get involved together and then like i said join oceana or california environmental voters and take action uh to hold your elected leaders accountable to make that change to conserve and protect our oceans wonderful okay so i have one lighter question for you what is okay. your favorite marine animal my favorite marine animal is dolphins because they're little surfers. I love it because they're just so social and, uh, you know, they love people and they love the water and, you know, they, they do the body surfing like, <laughs> like I do. So it's just very fun um, to see them, you know, when I go to the beach and just see them out frolicking and playing. I love a lot of different, you know, ocean animals, but like, I think dolphins are just like my easiest favorite. Me too. Okay, and lastly, is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we sign off today? So one of the things that I wanna tell everyone is the importance of the Build Back Better Act. Basically, this was the president's agenda to make sure that we transition away from you know, um, oil and pollution into green energy. It had a lot of great investments in climate change prevention tactics, but also it included a ban on offshore drilling. The thing is, is that while it passed the House, it has stalled in the Senate. And what we're looking at is that in the Senate, they're hoping to reintroduce a climate plus sort of bill that invests in a lot of the climate provisions that we saw in Build Back Better. But what's not included is that ban on offshore drilling. So I need folks to call their senators wherever you are and say that it's absolutely vital that the Senate package includes a ban on offshore drilling to protect and conserve our oceans and help us make that transition to green energy. It's absolutely vital and it's a really great way for us to make a lasting impact on our communities. The other thing that I think is super important is just make sure that you're asking folks in leadership to prioritize our oceans at every single turn. One of the ways you can do this is like we're appointing a new Supreme Court justice Make sure that you're asking your senator to find a Supreme Court justice that prioritizes ocean conservancy. When you're talking to your state officials or even your local community, um, like mayor and city council members, talk to them about things like the Blue New Deal, um, which talks about how we can make sure that there's a good transition away from, you know, offshore oil drilling and things like that, and like conserving our ocean and making sure that, you know, it's sustainable and open access for all. Um, you know, it's not just the president and it's not just Congress that makes decisions on conservation and protection. It is your state supervisor, you know, it's your state legislator. It is your county supervisor. It's your mayor. It's your city council members. You know, make sure that you are constantly talking to these folks um, about this issue. And, you know, together, if we get our friends together, you join an org, you know, you can actually make a lasting impact on you know, protecting the ocean so that we can all enjoy it together um, for a long time to come. Wonderful, thank you so much, Erin, for joining us today. So don't forget to catch our next Ocean Steward Spotlight in March, tentative date to come. And um, yeah, I just wanna thank you again, that was really awesome. Thank you, I had so much fun. You're just such a joy to talk to and I hope everyone has fun and gets involved. <laughs>